Rough Cut Science Series. Today we have Tony Hartcharn from Land Resources and Environmental Sciences, and he's going to talk about a provocative topic, interrogating a soil. Kind of wow. an interesting thought. And uh, Tony got his PhD at uh, UC Davis, and you came here from James Madison. Mm -hmm. And with that, I'll let Tony have at it and tell us all kinds of cool things. Thanks, Tony. Thanks, Todd. So the announcement, uh, did you have anything to add? What's that? Oh, and be sure to pull your phones out, Dave, uh, so, and, and vote, right? So I was double dog dared to throw this up at you, and I can come back to this in the very end. I'm hoping to run about 45 minutes, uh, and if there's Q&A, I can come back to why this is greeting you. So the question before you, if you have a phone, you can vote, Douglas. Which equation is the correct equation for photosynthesis as presented in, and I had to change this to a textbook. Um, it's actually, for those of you who are familiar with him, Paul Gannon's sustainability textbook. Not my textbook. Um, and what you would do is kind of cool. You can basically send a text. You're going to send it to 22333. And then you're going to vote for one of these crazy numbers because I'm too cheap to subscribe for personalized keywords, right? So um, have at it, and let's see if we can get, what do we got, 10 people? Looks like 10 people here. Uh, oh, wait, Mac, you have to vote. I will. Okay. And then while you guys are voting, I am, have been requested to oh promote... <laughs> Volunteers needed for cool science outreach event. Nano Micro Days is April 13th. Just take one of these with you. And remember, academics are famous for discounting future time. So go ahead and do that. And just sign up for April 13th. And that looks good enough for me. Uh, I will not even tell you the right answer because <laughs> I think that way you can stand on the edge of your seats all lecture. And uh, you're welcome to vote, but I am, I've got to move on because I only have 100 slides. Uh, so what I'm going to try to talk about today is how to interrogate a soil. Tip of the hat to my master graphic design person in the back there. Uh, it's not the way to interrogate um, a soil. It's just a couple ways. And really, you're going to see it's mostly one. And it's basically a fingerprinting exercise. Um, I'll give you examples of five projects that my lab is involved with, but really one of them is going to occupy, I think it's like 25 minutes. So interrupt me as we go. And uh, I think it takes more than a village to be an effective soil interrogator. And in fact, one of my mentors is right here, Jerry Nielsen. Uh, so he might have some uh, extra um, advice on how to interrogate a soil, but I do want to call uh, just super quickly, I'll be talking mostly about his work, my master's student, John Sugden, at the top. Um, I don't really have time to talk about my other master's student's work, Dicey Sanchez. She is using Basin Wild Rye to interrogate, uh, you know, mine-contaminated soils. And then I've got overgrad, Sam Atkins. I'll speak very, very briefly at the end about a project that he's working on in the lab. And then Russell is here, and I'll speak very briefly about some of his work as well. But it does take a total village uh, to figure out more effective ways to interrogate a soil. And then um, I will, um, I, I need to acknowledge, you know, I've gotten a lot of departmental support. This is a super fun talk to give. I am thrilled to be here. Thank you for the invitation. Um, we, it takes money to do these things. Uh, and we've gotten some support, grad studies, the BPR, College of Ag, Office of International Programs, Montana Wheat and Barley, NSF, Washington Foundation. I'm going to come back to these funders because if you can think of a way to plug in to some of the work that we're doing, please pile on. And uh, this is not one of my Soil Ninja's vehicles. This is, of course, another way to interrogate a soil. Um, and I am very proud of that, that effort right there. Um, and so I will highlight some of, you know, just these guys in the lab, but feel free to ask any questions. And uh, I'm going to give this away. Like, the way I think that you should interrogate a soil is set up a working interrogator training program, right? That's the punchline for today, so you can leave now. Uh, but if we could just get a bunch of interrogators in the pipeline, and tap their creativity, I think that would be awesome. 
So I'm going to cover, try to sell you guys on why you should even bother interrogating the soil. I'll talk about some of the baby steps that the lab is involved with. And then I'll close. You'll see it's only like three or four slides at the very end with some of the future steps. And again, if you can think of any way to plug in, love to have you. Um, so I have this crazy notion that if we could build soil literacy, maybe we might improve the way that we manage uh, what is depicted here. This is work by Griggs et al., you know, the Earth's life support system. Crazy notion, probably. Um, you probably are all familiar with these things called the Millennium Development Goals. I was not aware until I did this similar talk uh, in Peru that these have actually expired. Um, so this expired or they're expiring this year. And so they're being replaced by this other fancy thing called Sustainable Development Goals. So we went from MDG to SDG. Lots of stuff in there, and I know you can't read it, Eric, but that's okay. All of this sort of comes together on this other notion that people are referring to as planetary boundaries. And we could ask this question, you know, where are we today? And that means that we need to have effective ways to interrogate soil and which trajectories might be least risky. Um, that's the big sell. And then I do like this graphic, and again, this is from this big at all paper, I think, last year, but, you know, everything that we're doing is driven by money. You'll see that's sort of my last slide. Uh, if you've got extra money, let me know. Uh, that economic system is framed within a socio-cultural system, and then, of course, you've got, you can probably recognize that outer life support system. And so here they all are, sustainable development goals, and, you know, to what extent can smarter interrogation of soils help us do a better job? And uh, I think Stephanie Ewing is the first one that clued me into this. Some people are actually thinking about, well, how do we close the yield gap, right? This might be for the M is maize, the W, I'm supposed to be pointing with the mouse. So the M is for maize, the W for wheat, good old Montana, and then rice R. You know, how do we close these yield gaps if we have to um, feed 9 billion people in this generation? And it's interesting, the title of this paper from Nature is Closing Yield Gaps Through Soil, Through Nutrient and Water Management, but really, I think they're actually talking about soil management. And I'm going to um, really try to leverage this concept of a yield gap, because I wonder if MSU, we have educational yield gaps. And are we really minting as many soil interrogators as competently as we need to be to meet some of these challenges, right? How do we feed a world and not have a lot of folks go hungry. And then uh, most facetiously, I think the reason that we should interrogate soils is that I have a couple exceptions here, but soils aren't very good at reading textbooks. This is just a, a picture I took when I was in the middle of a conference multitasking. Uh, so soils don't really show up at conferences. They're really bad at reading maps. And I would argue to you that they're horrendous at telling their own stories. And so that is really the main reason that I'm trying to cultivate some soil interrogators in my lab. So here's some baby steps. And I'm going to focus mostly on my master's student's project. Uh, you should know it. And I really do not have time to talk about these other projects. But uh, we know it as the litho sequence work. And I'll explain what that means. He's also done some climo work. Russell's done some pyro work. I'll talk about that very briefly. I'm not going into utro or carbo, but happy to answer questions if you've got them. All right, so one of the things you can do if you want to interrogate a soil is you can bring some underwear to the soil, and you could bury the underwear in the soil. This is not something my lab is doing. Um, and, and what you're doing is you're asking the question, can we index soil quality, microbial activity, right? This is substrate-induced respiration by measuring the rot of your, your briefs right there. Um, another strategy besides bringing something to the soil, and I'll come back, we're going to loop back, this is one of my ending slides, something else that we can bring to soil, is just to ask the soil where it is, what's going on. And so an important element in that is just to dig a bunch of soil pits, right? Um, it's sort of a necessary step. And so I'm going to talk about this, what I think is a world-class litho sequence 15 miles south of campus. Um, this is a close-up of one of those images, and again, just like boxers, those briefs were rotting in the soil. This is a great example of what we know as zebra rock. Apologies to those in earth sciences. It's also known as gneiss. That's spelled with a G-N-E-I-S-S. -S. And I could basically dig through this gneiss.
It is rotten rock with this pencil right here. Um, pretty spectacular. And of course, you're going to need to know a little bit about our friend here, the periodic table of elements. Um, and you should be broadly familiar with this periodic table of elements. And it'll be helpful as we interrogate these soils in the lipo sequence. So we're going to be doing what we're called, and the reason you have to know periodic table of elements, we're going to be doing geochemical fingerprinting. All right. So this should freak you out a little bit, but these are just ball and stick models for different minerals that are in soil. And uh, it might be hard for you to see in the back, but there are a bunch of red balls here, right? This is from something known as the Virtual Mineral Museum. Those red balls are oxygen. As a pop quiz question, I always ask my students, what is the dominant element that you're standing on, digging in, growing food in, growing cow? It's oxygen. That's where all those red balls are. Okay, we're going to branch out a little bit now that you know a little bit of trivia. And the way we're going to branch out is courtesy of an amazing sequence. Again, I would argue it's a world-class sequence of rock types. Let's see if this works. I'm so unskilled in PowerPoint. That gets me really excited. So I just turn it on its side. And what we got, a stratigraphic column, you know, is basically a stack of rocks. And what I want you to imagine is that we went out there and we just dug a bunch of pits on different rocks. These don't match up with this stratigraphic column, uh, but you'll see how they do. All right, so these are the rocks. Sorry, these are the pits. They're on different rocks. And this is a stratigraphic column. And if you're curious, I should actually pop quiz you guys on which rock is at the bottom. And it's a 50-50, right? You're going to vote left right. Um, one of these has to be at the bottom because they're all stacked together. And actually, all these pits co-occur within a, like a mile of each other. World-class litho sequence. Which one's on the bottom? You're going to vote left or right on the count of three and just yell it out. One, two, three. Left. Oh, my gosh. Uh, I should skip ahead because I'm spending way too much time on this. So this is what we call our basement knife. Very, very awesome. You guys are already highly trained soil interrogators. So after we've dug the pits, the first thing we go is we use our periodic table of the element and we say, hmm, what is an A horizon? This is not just one horizon, but this is what we technically call in soils the A horizon. That's the uppermost root sugar injection zone. And we can characterize the chemistry here. And I'll walk you through this little legend. I'm sure it's hard to tell. But most of the pies of the soil pies are actually dominated by SiO2, so silica dioxide. You could think about that roughly as quartz. And what we're really interested in, of course, is, hmm, I wonder what the rocks look like. That's why we went there. We wanted a world-class litho sequence. So we dig some rocks out of the ground, and we characterize those. And I hope it's obvious to you that there's a lot more difference in the rocks than there is in the soils that must have been born from that rock, right? So here I'll just highlight one. You guys might not have known this. This giant purple, whatever the color is, can you guys guess what element that is? We're talking limestone. Right, so we should think of limestone as calcium carbonate, and so this giant, almost 50% of that limestone rock we pulled out of the bottom of it is calcium oxide, right? So all these are presented in oxide form. One of the things that's kind of cool is that despite the crazy differences in those rocks, it sure looks like we're smearing those differences by the time we get to the top of the soil profile, at least to my eyeball. I mean, whatever happened to the calcium signal right here, because that shrank pretty small and it looks pretty similar across the... So we'll talk about like how that happens. And I used to teach my ninjas and future interrogators, uh, this really important question. Then I had to change it after I went to Peru, and I'll explain why. So the fundamental question is, who's your daddy? Right? So we look in a soil pit. They're all standing there. They're getting hypothermic. I'm worried if I'm going to lose my job because someone's going to put a shovel through their foot. Who's your daddy? Right? And what that's really asking is, are these rocks the parent material for that soil? I had to change the who's your daddy to who's your mommy after I went to Peru because in Peru, they speak Spanish and Quechua, but in Spanish, they don't talk about parent material. It's not like you don't know if it's the dad or the mom. They talk about roca madre, mother rock, right? So now what I'm really asking here is, and you'll see this, there are little pieces of Spanish through all this talk, who is your mommy, right, would be one way to ask this. 
So we live in Montana, and we're missing some information, it turns out. So I have this long segue about what we're missing here. You can sort of tell from the graphic where I'm going. Um, before I show you what was missing from that figure, I can't think of a better paper than this work by Byrne et al. Just came out, Geochemica, Cosmochemica Acta, and it really goes through the long history of trying to bring a mass balance approach to this geochemical fingerprinting, right? And what they've, they've got something even fancier than where I'm going, which is they're really interested in how many clay-sized particles, the colloids are moving out of the soil, and also what's moving out in solution. But, and so they call it the dual phase mass balance model. But it's awesome, right? When they're setting up their methods, they, you can trace mass balance attempts, bringing mass balance attempts to soil back more than 100 years, okay? So this is part of that tradition. This is what was missing from that figure, is that we live in a dusty place. I mean, over the weekend, I had enough dust on the back of my minivan that I wrote parent material, question mark, and then my kids saw that I was doing that, and they went in there and they did all this graffiti and messed it up. It's a really dusty place. What we start with dust is that we actually are influenced here in Montana by something called volcanic ash. So I'm gonna travel and teach you a little bit about volcanic ash. Right, so I've got four examples that I'll talk about today, and then I can come back to Q&A. Um, but this is the one that I want to start with, is volcanic ash. And you're not supposed to be able to read what's inside that circle. So just last week, Susie was talking about geocaching, how it's a great way to do science communication. I'm like, whoa, when I Google Mazama, up comes a geocaching site. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to talk a little bit about this figure here, but for those of you who are unfamiliar with Mazama, doesn't exist anymore because it blew its top 7,700 years ago, give or take a year, and uh, it created what's called Crater Lake, okay? But that mass went somewhere because here we practice conservation mass, if you looked at the study guide. And these are isopacks, so we've got about a foot here, 30 centimeters inside the circle, closest to what used to be Mount Mazama, and then five centimeters, about two inches, extending, now we get in a little little bit of uh, Montana, and then out here, this is listed as one centimeter. And this is not the only volcano that is providing potential parent material to our part of the world in Montana. I think that's in the next figure, right? So this is a shot from uh, the USGS, and what's showing here, and you're going to come back to these two elements, is Glacier Peak Ash. That's uh, apparently erupted about 14,500 years ago, and then we've got that crater lake, and you saw that plume before. These guys have a great website. They're thinking about Mazama along Interstate 90, and what I would love to do with my lab is bring, extend, inter, they only go um, from, I think, western Washington to eastern Washington along Interstate 90. I'm like, hey, no, come on, play over on our end of Interstate 92. So that's coming up, and the important thing about ash is that especially with Mazama, you know exactly when it blew, right? So I'll have a close-up of that figure coming up and why that's important. So through a coastal state like Oregon, you get excited. Oh, there's my Mazama ash. We geochemically fingerprinted it. Everything above it must be more recent than 7,700 years ago. But I don't do the submarine soil thing. You know, I do more stuff like this. So in 5,700 B.C., big old layer of Mazama ash comes in, which this guy is showing right here. Everything else above it must have come in more recently, also known as tephra chronology. Unfortunately, you'll be like, oh, my God, I hope you go to dates. I don't have any dates for you today. But this is just an example of an approach, right, how to interrogate a soil profile and ask it, well, are you old and senile, or are you young and newfangled and a toddler? All right, so I'm going to step back through some of the approaches that you can use to fingerprint, geochemically fingerprint that ash. And again, Glacier Peak washed over Montana, you'll see there's some discrepancies in this uh, eastern border right here. And then here's the Mazama plume as well. So this is work 1975, and this is what they did. They said, you know what? We can do major elements. And I've shown you some of these before with my own soils. And so in Montana, we get 73% silica dioxide right there, our friend SiO2. Oh, and the glacier peak ash looks like it comes in at 77.1. Those are really close. And by the way, those are your units of percent. Right? So we can convert, and you'll see why this is important. This 72%, 73%, 730 parts per million. You'll see why that's important. I'm like, you know what? I can't really tell if my ash sample is Mazama 
or Glacier Peak. Well, then we got to go back because, of course, everything's already been done in science. So we go back about 50 years to Harvard's uh, work, and he's got, you can see it right there, trace element. I'm going to call them minor elements for those data. And this is his map. Remember Glacier Peak coming over? We have some discrepancy. Don't know what's going on here. There might be dragons there. And so we're trying to sort that out. And I've just been trading emails with Dave Moak. And we're going to go Mazama ash hunting. Uh, I'm excited. And this is the advantage of 50-year-old work, is that they were able to characterize, maybe these are the dragons, right? You have no idea. I don't know how to pronounce a lot of these elements, but I'll introduce you to them and why they're important a little bit. Mazama versus Glacier Peak. You know, we got an ash sample from a buddy up in Helena. We've characterized it, and I've tried to match these up. Look, you can do the math right here on my ash. Is it a better match for Mazama or Glacier Peak? Don't bother. There is no volcanic ash influence on our soils in highlight. And part of it has to do with the elemental composition of at least our ash proxy versus what we can read in the soil. So let's go to these minor elements. This is another LUST proxy. This one is called Post Farm. You may not be familiar with it. It's five miles to the west of campus. Really important pit for me. I was digging in it yesterday. This is what it looks like up close. And what I really want you to focus on is that this is the A horizon. And just imagine, like, we're wondering, hmm, I wonder how much dust came in there, and to what extent this soil right here was born of that roca madre, you know, the underlying, quote, unquote, parent material. Um, because all soils, maybe, you can imagine them being this mix of a top-down influence versus bottom-up influence. The reasons for the Legos is we were out there, Douglas and I, Justin, uh, teaching some future soil interrogators how to interrogate a soil. Oh, here they are. Right? There you are, Justin. So what we did is we went down one meter. So we got all this uh, messy stuff up here called the sugar injection zone. And we pulled what we want to think of as a long-term less foxy. And so we've analyzed that chemistry as well. And then there are two more that are left. And this is where I want you thinking about the back of my minivan. Remember I wrote parent material on the back? So I wanted like a fresh dust source. My grad student's like, hmm. Where can I go? And wouldn't this be the obvious place to go get a dust sample? So I guess there's a lot of money in the football program, but uh, they replaced their roof. And my grad student, John's like, hmm, I guess I'm going to get up there. And he sneaks his way up onto the roof, and he samples twice. One we're going to call the fifth floor roof. You know, it's only been up there for years, so we know exactly what time period we've measured, and then goes to the sixth floor as well. And those are the two last circles that I just showed you, and I'm going to go back right there. So we've got two bad stadiums, fifth floor, sixth floor, we've got a post farm, and then we've got that ash sample from up in Helena. And then I'll walk you through some of the math, right? Because what we're asking is, what section of dust built each of these soils that are all within one mile of each other? All right. This is the nitty-gritty chemistry, like hang in there, it's not a lot of slides. So this crazy geochemist, Dan Muse, goes to the Channel Islands right off the coast of California, and he has this idea. I wonder if I can fingerprint dust out on the Channel Islands. And so this is what he does. And you're going to see some slides like this from Highlight. So he takes, you don't, there's not going to, this will not be on the test, the lanthanum to ytterbium ratio for all the Mojave dust that might be blowing into his site. And then he takes the europium anomaly for the Mojave dust that might be blowing into his site. He looks at the soils, two different particle sizes, silts and clays, and then he compares that with those values. These are, uh, we want to call them minor elements. If you've never heard of europium, that's okay. I, I hadn't either, or lanthanum and ytterbium, right? But I hope you can see that his soils match better onto the dust than they do on the rock that they're sitting on. This is Roca Madre, and this is the Lus influence. So the crazy thing about Dan is, and there's mineralogy in here, and there's particle sizes. I mean, he is like crackerjack geochemist. And I'm like, wait a minute. I've been on those channel lines when I was postdoc. They're these huge silt mantles, right? I mean, you just walk up, you're like, okay, that's clay, and that's all silty. That's why they wrote silt mantle. Really? You needed all that fancy geochemistry to tell you that there's the old silt cap and that that wasn't born from the rotting of the underlying volcanic rock? 
okay, I'm going to cut him a lot of slack because it's a totally great thing. It's always awesome to get color photos into a pub. But you'll see we brought this technique <laughs> to highlight. This is what it looks like. Hard to read. I apologize. This is a europium lanthanum ytterbium plot for nice. Sandstone, shale, limestone, basaltic andesite, the volcanic rock. In every case, all the axes are identical. What I'm plotting here are either the rocks, the roca madre underneath, so this would be the sandstone rock in this minor element space. And then I've also plotted some triangles that represent the lust that might be floating in on top of that sandstone profile in this one example. And I'll cut to the chase. We rocked it, right? So on the volcanic pit, you have a, it's hard to see here, and I should circle it with the mouse. Um, this is our rock end member. Can't believe how light this is. That's rock, and this is dust. And the circles all represent different horizons going from the darker A down to whatever horizon we could get to above the rock. And I hope you can see that this A horizon on the volcanic soil lies in between, it's so awesome, between the rock and the dust. And if you're doing your math, you can say, whoa, this soil right here is closer in this minor element space to the rock. So let's just say it's 60% rock and it's 40% loss. Awesome. Okay. What is going on with knife? Uh, this is rut row number one here, which is that my soil on the knife is way outside of my end member space. The rocks, I can't even fit this on here. This is on 27, so this rock should actually be way over here. And by the way, the ash plots like up here and off of all the graphs too. So we just have issues with all the other lithologies. This is not too surprising. I mean, Dan Muse, he is, I told you, crackerjack geochemist. And this is the same model, felsic dust over mafic rock. And so it works well. It doesn't work well when the dust sort of looks like a gamish of the rock that it's parked on top of. So we needed to dig deep and this is really John's effort. Okay, so I know this looks scary, I'll walk you through it. So this is how the data come back from the lab, okay? These are major elements. There's our friend SiO2, silica dioxide, okay? Those are big percentages, right? What I'm showing here is post-farm one, two, three, four. Four is what we're calling our dust or lust proxy. This is the nice pit, and every time I've coated something in pink, it's a potential parametrial. So we could have post-farm four dust blowing into highlight. We could have the nice pit is built of the rock that it's sitting on top of. We got an unweathered rock sample. You can see right here, 90% SiO2. And then we've got all these crazy Bobcat Stadium and ash samples right here. The thing for me to point out to you is that puppy right there. What I'm not showing you is all these columns, and you're grateful, between B and AT, that those are the minor elements, including our friend Euterbium. And I'll show you how the math works. So we take what are known as the heavy rare earth elements, right? And these I'm highlighting here, don't ask me to pronounce erbium and homium. Uh, what we're doing again is we're taking these values. These are in parts per million, okay? Parts per million. This is the sandstone bottom rock. These are two shale samples. And this is our limestone rock. And we can do some math. And we can ask this question, are the soils closer in heavy rare earth element space to the lust that might be falling on top or to the rock from below. All right, and see these elements were all there waiting for you. They're just hidden in here called the lanthanides and the actinides. You thought you'd never have to go that deep in the periodic table of elements, but they're our friends, we think, for doing this geochemical fingerprinting. And it's really simple. It's just the closest match wins. I gave you the example of ytterbium before. So PF4 comes in with a value of 17 parts per million. Notice that this is what we're aiming for is six, right? So we can't calculate, calculate a difference on itself. We're just looking for the closest match. And in this case, it looks like for euterbium, Bobcat Stadium fits for wins, and so it gets a little X right there. We can take all eight heavy rare earth elements, do the difference again, closest match wins. And then you can see this math is the same as the math that we did before. This is my whole distance, 5.4. The nice is 3.9 away from it. So you can calculate that this nice A soil right here is 72% lus. You go all the way up to highlight, and it's still feeling dust 
up there, right? Those lodgepole pines are doing work capturing dust. And the balance, the growth commodity from the rock below, must be 28%. All right, that's what it looks like, right? That was our nice pit. We've got dust, maybe father rock. So I titled the talk in Peru. I said, uh, ¿Qué pasó con roca padre? That means, like, what on earth happened to father soil? And, you know, I think, you know, they kind of enjoyed that. But that was after I learned that they don't use parent material. They use roca madre. So here we are, 72%, 28%. Aren't you feeling super smart? What you can do with that, right, is I knew the composition of the dust, and I knew the composition of the underlying rock down there. Not the rotted rock, but unweathered night. So I can create a hybrid parent material. That's super important. I need a hybrid parent material because that's going to give me the best indication of who's your daddy or who's your mommy, right? And I'll tell you why that's important. So here's our hybrid material. I've just sort of popped this in over on top of the one that was there before representing the rocks. So this is the hybrid parent material, 72% loss, pop, and 28% mom. Okay, so this is the most important question. All my interrogators, all my ninjas have to ask, like, so what? Don't, like, seriously, like, make me care. I don't care if it's 72% loss. Like, seriously? Okay, so in Peru, they do care a lot. So it's amazing how fast I could find this. So this is just a headline announcing that they have confirmed that the birth certificate for Obama is false, right? So there's another reason they care about getting the parent right right, to get the birth certificate right. And it's all here. And trust me, I'm not really talking about this. All I need to do is tell you this is how you do mass balance. And the huge problem with mass balance, remember this 100-year effort, is that I need to know, just to translate for you, I need to know the concentration of, for example, zirconium in the parent. There's just one box there. Oh, maybe we're good if we pick a hybrid parent. And then this is a J, this corresponds to a mobile element. Think about sodium, right? The reason the oceans are salty is that sodium was weathered out of rock. And those go through. These are density terms for the rock. Got to know the density, and maybe we want to do a hybrid. So that is where John is right now, is working with this hybrid. So I'm hoping that you will care about this. So if we were to just assume that the nice soil was born from nice rock, or the sandstone soil from the sandstone rock, et cetera, these would be the calculated mass losses, cumulative, over the life of that soil. Kilos per square meter, it's really per volume because we cut it off at a standard depth so we could compare across these. This graph, to my eyeball, does not look like this graph, okay? And this is 100% rock and 100% loss. Qualitatively different. What happens on the hybrid? On the hybrid, this is what we get. So if you assume that your soil was born of the rock that it's on, you're going to be off a little bit trying to figure out your mass flux. You're like, well, really? Why do I care about silica loss? Well, maybe you don't. Maybe you care about the most important rock-derived macronutrient on the planet, which is called phosphorus, right? So again, these are phosphorus losses. I've changed the axis here. It used to be kilos. Now it's grams. This graph does not look like this one, although they're pretty close. And then this really matches well onto that. And I think that's reflecting the loss influence. So these are P205 fluxes. Let me make an argument to you. You got a box of soil. The lodgepole pine are sucking hard trying to get slurpable phosphorus out of that soil box. And you can do some math here. I think that's the next slide, right? So if we work out, there's a mass loss, right? And I've just given you those numbers. This is supposed to say 300 grams of phosphorus because I've converted from oxides to non-oxides per square meter, same thing. But now we've estimated the age of the soil. Don't have that ash yet. We're working on this number. But let's just estimate that the soil is up there at 20,000 years old. That gets you a flux, right? That's a total supply from the hybrid parent of 15 milligrams of phosphorus per square meter per year. And it's a perfectly fair question for you to say, my students do this all the time. Tell me, is that a big number or a little number? Well, and so then you have to look at the foliar phosphorus concentration of a lodgepole pine needle. It turns out this is about 20 times smaller than what a lodgepole pine needs in order to make its living, right? So there's in, this, this is a, a, a great, this is great evidence that phosphorus is intensively biocycled up there in highlight. 
And people get excited about phosphorus and forests. Uh, so this is a big hoity-toity journal, PNAS last year, and these guys uh, are like, hey, dude, bedrock composition regulates mountain ecosystems and landscape evolution. And, uh, you know, our lab's been chewing on this paper for a while. And, uh, in fact, uh, the, the main author has been uh, dressed down by my undergrad who also went to AG. He's like, dude, you know, trees don't really grow on rocks, so maybe it's your soil composition. And uh, so they got really excited. They're like, hey, this is one of the most dramatic gradients in rock-derived phosphorus that we can find. Um, we're like... Yeah, game on. We got 34x difference in P2O5 between the gneiss and the basaltic andesite. And so it was Tad that said, well, why don't we uh, go sample these lodge poles that are growing up there? So this is Tad. Uh, he's not napping there, uh, amazingly. Uh, like, he's actually engaged <laughs> and, uh, you know, showing us how it's done, how to find the center of that. I forget how old that one. Do you remember? Where are you? How old was it? You don't remember? Anyway, so what we did is we just looked at um, how old were these trees, again, across the litho sequence. And I hope you can see one of them is missing. Um, and so what I just wanted to call your attention to is that for all intents and purposes, despite, despite there being a huge rock difference between the gneiss, which is like 0.01%, that's in pink right here, the trees don't seem to care. Well, is it because that whole area is just getting totally slammed with loss? Is there an uncoupling from that Roca Madre? I'll leave that for you because I think it is sort of interesting to think about that looks like lodgepole pine, and it is, and it's interrogating soil. The, these pines are interrogating soils, but we're looking at at least four, potentially five different rock types right there in that one image. All right, so tip of the hat to John. He, uh, he, he rocked that. Um, I'm going to spend a couple slides on pyro. I think I'm on schedule. And so another thing that you can do besides, and I'm not going to go into too much chemistry here, besides geochemically fingerprinting a soil, is you can burn it. And uh, then Russell has gotten excited. I mean, I think Russell is a pyromaniac, actually. And so the, this is obviously an iconic figure here, uh, representation of fire. But, you know, we're asking this question, if these trees are sitting on different rocks, and the soils are reflecting different rocks, what effect does fire have on those soils? And this goes all the way back to one of my postdocs in South Africa. So in South Africa, we took advantage of a 60-year long, uh, 60 years of maintenance. Well, they did the best they could. This is supposed to be control unburned experimental burn plots in Kruger National Park. And what I really want to call your attention to is that I'm showing you four burn treatments. Control, never supposed to burn. Of course it burns can't keep a fire, savanna fire, out of uh, these control plots. So it's, it, I would call this occasionally burned. This is burned every three years in the wet season, every three years in the dry season. This is burned annually. What I really want to draw your attention to, I shouldn't have put all these data together, is that the zirconium levels uh, increase. Okay? So with burning, you lose organic matter, and it's not like the ash, right, the savanna grasses, is generating uh, a zirconium input in these cases. It's that you've lost organic matter, so you residually enrich the zirconium. And so we asked this question, I wonder if we can bring this really cool result. This was published in like an appendix, so no one will ever see it, um, to Montana. There are good reasons to bring fire research, I don't have to tell you, to Montana. Um, and lots of you have seen this figure, but I like thinking about the gallons, our backyard hopefully someday experimental forest, uh, as a sort of a bellwether, right? Like uh, what will happen to fire frequency? And of course now I'm super interested too because I've just done this whole litho sequence project. Could there be some interactions between fire and the rock types that it's burning on? So this is such a huge bummer because it's like be careful what you wish for. So remember that when you burn something, you're supposed to increase the zirconium levels. This is a profile uh, dug on a volcanic soil. And you know this number is supposed to be like 570. Uh, so this soil obviously is not reading my work. No one reads my work, but that's OK. Um, and so this is a little bit of an issue. And actually, Russell would be happy to, happy to answer any questions you have on weirdness with things like zirconium, high field strength elements, um, post-fire. The cool thing that we did is that he experimentally burned 
unburned soil. So 343 zirconium to begin with, he sticks into a muscle furnace and simulates burning, right? So 50 to 500 degrees Celsius over varying durations, 5 to 60. And in general, you can see some of the numbers are bigger, but it's a pretty modest increase, right? So we're still working out some of the details here. But I love this combination of field work and lab work. And this is like the coup de grace. I roll into Bozeman in August of 2012 in my Subaru, and this Millie fire blows up the first month that I'm here. So this red right here is the Millie fire. This is, again, about 15 miles plus. I was describing a bunch of data. These are equal images right over here. And this is all Russell's work. And what I hope you can see and is obvious to you is that, whoa, there are different rock types there, right? There are different mass, mass rock types. This is a big band of gneiss. That's the basement gneiss at the bottom. And all the green is like the volcanic cap rock. That's why we have great ice climbing, right? That's all the green. Whoa, check out the burn severity that comes back. I mean, just to uh, Tony's untrained eye, it sure looks like there are higher severity fires associated with the gneiss. Russell's like, dude, you can't eyeball that thing. You've got to take it into GIS. And so he takes it into GIS, and he calculates the actual area inside the milli. Okay, so these are volcanic mapped soils, right? These are pixels converted into area, and this is the different burn severities that the Forest Service gives us data on. So unburned, low severity, medium severity, and high severity. Whoa, over on the nice, that is asymmetrically higher severity fire on top of the nice, right? So my take home to you right now is that yeah, you might have thought that fire wasn't a picky herbivore, but to our mind and our way of thinking, it sure looks like it is. And there's some extra details in there I can go into the Q&A. Here's the other thing, though, because I know a lot of you are ecologists. I'm hoping that a future take-home, and we'll see if Russell gets to this in a class project he's working on right now, is pyromineralization. You might not have heard that term, but remember, mineralization is just like Edward Scissors' hand clipping of a form of phosphorus that a plant cannot slurp and turning it into a slurpable form, right? So pyromineralization doesn't require a microbe or an enzyme. It's just thermal, right? So pyromineralization of soil phosphorus. And, and we're wondering whether that's ecologically significant. I'll leave it up to you to decide whether that phosphorus came from the lust or the rock. All right. And then, like, first slides, uh, future steps, and it's all about pipelines. Maybe because I'm thinking about Keystone Pipeline, whatever, but you'll see that there's a, three, a theme here with three pipelines. So the first one is this thing called the Zero Emissions Research and Technology Project. So you might not know this. This is the brick breeding place, so we must be right there underneath my finger. So if you just go a little bit west, you end up with this place where there's a 100-meter pipe underground, right there where that circle is meters down, 100 meters long. Why'd they stick a pipe in the middle of the hayfield? Well, because they wanted to inject some CO2. And if you happen to be in the right place at the right time, you can see them lugging the liquid carbon dioxide off. The cool thing about this carbon dioxide, they made it from methane. So it has an isotopic signature, delta 13C. I, so if you guys report to Lee Spangler, don't tell him I said this, but uh, no, I can't. Can't be so he doesn't want me to call it like our own little homebrew bomb spike, right? But it's basically we're interested in asking the question, when you inject CO2 that has a delta 13C, you don't need to know what that is, of minus 50 per mil. Remember you guys were asked, what is the equation for photosynthesis at the beginning of today's talk? So if you inject that CO2 and it's the growing season, do the plants refix? some of that delta 13C minus 50 per mil CO2, and then leak it out into the organic matter? If they did, now we have cheap labeled soil, and we can do all kinds of crazy experiments. <laughs> all right, so I need some help on this. Uh, oh, by the way, what, does anybody know what the delta 13C of uh, this little packet of air right next to this driver and, of course, in this room? What's the delta 13C? I told you that inside this tank, it's minus 50. What is it right here next to the driver? Yes, minus eight, right? So there's a big difference. And so when I show you this depth profiles on the next graph, we want to see like minus 40, right? Right over here at the surface. So here's that graph. Hard to see, I apologize. So thank you, Stan, for working these up. So these are delta 13C running from minus 25.5 to minus 28. And what we would have loved 
These are at one meter off the pipeline. This is the buried pipeline out just a little bit west of here, or two and a half meters off the pipeline, north and south are the two colored lines. What we really wanted to see was this thing come all the way over here in the root zone to like minus 40 per mil, because that would be a slam dunk. We labeled the soil organic matter, right? So these are samples of soil organic matter. So we're working with a woman uh, at Los Alamos. She's got a lot more isotopic data than we do. And so we're trying to make sense of this and see if we can still argue that our soil organic matter was labeled by the injection of minus 50 per mil CO2. Pipeline one, I've got two more pipelines. This is pipeline number two. So it turns out, you might not understand this, but this room is kept warm by something called a steam pipe, right? And so it runs from the steam plant on the campus. This is what it used to look like a couple weeks ago when we actually had snow. Uh, I don't know what happened to our winter. And so we just got permission from facilities to stick some, some uh, CO2 measuring rings in the ground. And we're really interested and we're betting lots of growlers of beer on whether above the steam pipe, which I hope you can see should be warmer, uh, it's gonna have a higher CO2 flux than off the steam pipe. And we can go into that in the Q&A. Then the last steam pipe, this is my setup for the last steam pipe. So I'm at, with my kids at a plenary on science communication, and there's this woman, Sunshine Menezes. You know her, right, Douglas? And she puts up this big graphic. I'm like, Cooper, you should be taking notes. He's nine, and he's like, okay, so here's one circle, what you said, and here's this other circle, what I care about. I love, love, love that, right? This is so important, right? The punchline here is how do you build a soil interrogator? And so, this is an effort that we we're all involved with in the fall and still sort of involved with, right? These are future interrogators. And what we're trying to figure out is how do you hook a kid on dirt? And this is my hope. I think this is a totally <laughs> unintentional zone of overlap. And how do we find that, right, for every student in our class? Um, I am so grateful he's a sort of sloppy cartoonist. And so this is my last, um, next to last slide. So this is a different kind of steam pipeline. Right? And so we've been talking and strategizing, and really I should have, you know, tip of the hat to Jamie Cornish and Susie Taylor. Um, last week, Susie was really talking about this continuum between informal science ed and formal science ed. And it's really interesting if you sort of break that out by different age groups. You know, these are big kids and these are little kids. And so we've gotten some results, some funding from the National Science Foundation to try to hook a kid on water and carbon cycle, and eventually soils, right? And then we are working, we got a small grant from the Washington Foundation. The Children's Museum of Bozeman has been really receptive. This would be what's called informal science ed because they meet once a week in what's called the STEAM lab. So that's science, technology, engineering, arts, and math pipeline. We're putting a proposal at CIOTA. I actually don't know that there's informal science ed possible for high schoolers, right? I mean, first of all, they're jacked on hormones and they want to drive and they got all these activities. I'm sort of feeling that pressure with my middle schooler. So I'm not sure that this will really fit in terms of a steam pipeline, but how do we recruit to the pipeline and then retain to the pipeline? Our NSF has a big component of pre-service teachers. And so we get them out there trying to learn how to teach a, I was just doing this on Monday, a fourth grader to get excited about carbon. Um, and then I did get some performance funding money from MSU, and so we are doing stuff in the soils class, and at 5 p.m. somewhere, I have a letter of intent due to USDA. And that's all I have. If you ask a question, please press the little microphone in front of you so it's green, so that the people online and our recording can hear you. Okay, so you were talking about the highlight soils, and it seemed like you were making a case that the lust was really important to the soil, and not so much the Oroco Madre. But then just over the hill, in the Mimley fire, it seemed like the parent material was really important. Um, what's going on? Right, the difference between, so the question was, if, if dust is important on one side of a drainage divide and highlight, then how can it be that I'm arguing that rock is important, not less important, on the fire severity graph? 
And, uh, you know, consistency is the hobgoblin of a small, small mind. But, no, I think one angle there is, to be fair, is that there are some confounding factors on my uh, broad sweeping generalization about, yeah, on this graph, right? Um, Russell, do you want to speak to some of those factors? <laughs> um, so, Get there's a mic. A lot, uh, I don't have a mic. Back okay. Here. Um, there's a lot of other things that obviously drive forest fire burn severity, including aspects, elevation of slope accumulated area, fuel load. Um, so, what Tony's not showing you is a few other graphs um, to try to kind of reduce those compounding variable, variables. We've compared aspect across the two lithologies along with of slope accumulated area and fuel load, and we, we find some small differences in there, but um, we, we think that um, the main driver of this is probably differences in soil water holding capacity across the different lithologies due to textural differences, especially thinking about different lithologies carrying uh, different amounts of water late into the summer when the, for, when the forest fire burns. Uh, yeah, and then the only other thing that I would add to that, so yes, there's a lot that's hidden here. Right? And I think the big one is that the fuel loads are actually different on the night versus the volcanic. But I mean, it's just, I, I want people to start thinking about little dust layers, and I thought I had an image here. Um, those dust layers are amazing dust traps, right? And so, so at some level, you're right. I mean, how can I argue for rock matters and then argue that rock doesn't matter? I thought you were going to go somewhere else for that question. That was awesome. Yes, John. Um, so I have a question, the one that you had showing the, um, all the different pear material, and then you were showing the phosphorus amount mm -hmm. in the trees and how the concentration in the needles was 20 times as much as the soils for phosphorus. Mm -hmm. so that's not surprising though, right? And if you look at nitrogen, it's the same thing. Plants are going to have just higher concentrations. Oh, so, well, I guess don't misunderstand. I guess. Um, I'm not just going to concentrations in a needle versus a soil concentration. I'm, I'm trying to index a total mass flux out of a soil box and ask the question, you know, is that enough to build with our recipe for life for a lodgepole pine, to build a lodgepole pine? Um, does that, I, I don't want to just yeah. do foliar concentration against soil concentration. Right. So I think what I'm trying to say is if you're going to do the, the mass flux for the soil, then you, you need the mass flux for the plant and not just the concentration for the plant. Absolutely, yeah. right? And so then the whole idea is how long is a needle retained, yep. right? And then to what extent are these macronutrients recycled internally, uh, you know, before the needle drop? So, and then also, I mean, I had to make an estimate for that calculation of, uh, yeah, how long does a lodgepole pine live and what's the turnover on a plot? So I just, you know, pulled some of Dan Binkley's. Uh, yeah, so that's hidden in this, but great point, to be fair. Yes, sir. Uh, so I'm curious about the, the ash between, you know, Mount Baker, was it Baker or Glacier Peak? I can't remember. One of those mountains, northern Washington versus Mazama, and, uh, you know, distinguishing them geochemically, well, stratigraphy, of course, plays a role, too. I mean, one is twice as old as the other. So what you get out into a place and you find one layer of ash like that photo and you're like, gosh, which one is it? Right, right. So well, I'm you had stratigraphy and I mean, one is to have a much deeper soil or less deposit on top than the other, for instance. I call those funkifying factors, right? So the, the thing is that once this deposit comes in and you can see there's been some other lust that's piled up in, in, on top of this one little profile, <laughs> this is constantly being churned up. Right, so it's hard to find, and we need to go looking, hunting for Mazama ash. I want to see a three-inch packet, right, that, that looks more or less intact. Does that make sense? Because I'm worried about, um, so I forgot to say, so in my book, lust, dust, ash, whatever you call it, want to call it, those are total cheater parent materials. And they're cheater parent materials because they have so much surface area that they effectively almost instantly weather. And that's actually a huge issue with volcanic ash. It's mostly glass. It basically turns to goop and it's gone. All you're left with in this profile could be ghosts of ancient volcanic eruptions past. And you know, trying to read that in these profiles, and that's absolutely a factor. I mean, that's a little on the thin side. Like, I'm nervous, right? And maybe I'm asking for too much to get a three-inch Mazama around here. But, uh, you know, I wouldn't mind three feet. Right, to be, to be safer. And then, you know, you could go right into the middle of the three 
foot vein of ash. It's like, you know, it's hard to find that here. But, uh, and then have some confidence that, yeah, this chemistry matches that event. Good point. But you could go to Washington and find Yep. Yep. And that's what these guys have done. Yes. Texting? What, what I text? Oh, you texted the, uh, what's the equation for photosynthesis? And uh, this was a double dog dare, I mentioned this. So the correct equation was none of the above, for those of you who are counting. Um, in fact, I guess we can just look. Uh, this is a good place to end. You know, uh, there's a certain pile-on effect. This is the winner. That is incorrect. But, yeah, any other questions? Is that, was that your question? Well, why, why do you do it? Oh, yeah, so I guest lectured in a class with college students, and I asked them this question three times in a 50-minute lecture. And I can now tell you I have quantitative evidence that I am a, an ineffective instructor. Uh, because although we started at 11 out of 60, it all, they saw it three times, right? And this is all in your study guide, by the way. They saw this exact question. And so I'm glad that you brought this up, because the comment that was made to me was, dude, you are being culturally elitist to use that instead of carbon dioxide. That, instead of the word written out, oxygen. I'm like, game on. He, I gave two slides for this person who shall remain anonymous next midterm. One half of the class will take the same question with these culturally elitist chemical shorthand symbols. And then the other one will have it all written out. We'll see. We'll see if the students do better, because uh, then it will be randomly assigned. I think it's a great experiment. I would just say, that's a lot of chemical equations to ask someone about. So never mind. So put yourself in the shoes of a, you know, a sophomore film class. Yeah. Or a film major. And, you know, uh, they did better than this room did. So I think you and I don't even have a